Well, let's go to the Lord tonight. Would you stand where you are? We're going to take these before the Lord. We just uh, we just believe in the power of prayer tonight. Amen. Father, we just we thank you, God. We thank you, Father, that we are able to come into your presence, Lord. We thank you that, Lord, that that you are a God that hears, that your ears are open, Father, that your arm is not short, that it is mighty, Father. And, and God, we thank you that, God, that our prayers, as your word says, they are mighty, Father, through you, these, these weapons of our warfare to the pulling down of strongholds, God, of the things the enemy would try to set up, Father, places in our lives that he would try to work against. Holy Spirit, tonight, we just pray that, God, that you would begin to, to meet every need, Father. You, you have heard every request, God. We pray, Father, for each one, God, each of these, Father, that is ill tonight, God, that, is, that has a, a, a sentence even upon their lives, many, Father. We just pray, God, for, for healing. You, you, you and your word said that you are the God that healeth me. And, Father, we know that you're the God that heals, God. We know that you are the God that delivers, Father. And we just lift each and every one of these that are sick unto you, God. We pray, Father, for that healing touch for the blood of the Lamb, Father, that by your stripes... We are healed, Father, physically, emotionally, mentally, Father, in every way, God, by your Spirit, Father, tonight. We thank you, Father, for delivering your people, God. Father, we lift those up, Father, that are just uh, struggling tonight, Father. Those, Father, that are uh, without jobs, God, we just pray that, Father, that you would meet every need, Father. That, God, that your spirit, Father, would be with them. That you would help them, Father. That you, Father, would, would, would be there and reveal yourself to them. That, God, that they would know that you are their source. That, Father, that it is you that causes us to and gives us the power to become wealthy. Father, you're the one that does all of these things. May we never think, Father, for a moment that, God, that we have done these things in our own strength and in our own power tonight. We pray for traveling mercies, Father, for all of those that are traveling, Charlene included, God. And Father, against the weather, Father, that is coming against us, God, and, and coming, Father, we just pray that, God, that you would protect them and watch over them and keep them, Father. And God, we just pray, Father, for, for all these procedures, God, that will be taking place. We place them all in your hands, knowing that, Father, that you care for us. And your word says that, God, that you would perfect those things that concern us. And Father, we've lifted up our concerns tonight, God, in every way, Father, and we just ask that you would meet, Father, every one. We pray, Father, for the families, God, that, have, that are going through a loss of a family member. We pray for the family and friends, God, that are there, God. We pray for comfort, for peace, Father, that your spirit, God, would, would come, Father, and minister to each one. For all of the requests, Father, that were, were made known, Father, in the women's chat, God, I just pray, Father, today. You've heard everyone you've seen everyone God we just come in agreement with them tonight in the mighty name of Jesus Christ that father we join our faith for the glory the honor of your name tonight father we pray that your word father would would go forth father in power that we would not just be hearers but we would be doers of your word I pray that God that we would be renewed we would be strengthened for the glory and the honor of your name we thank you God one more time as we come into this place, Father, thank you, God, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise God. You may be seated tonight as we, as we begin uh, 2 Kings chapter 2. We're going to pick up where we left off, and, and what, an awesome, what an awesome thought. You know, I mean, thank God, you know, we get to do this every Wednesday. That just means we don't have to rush anything, praise God. Sometimes we feel like we have to, though. <laughs> But praise God, we get to we get to to see who it is that God, or, or who God is, do, what God is doing in us, and and what His plans are for you and you and I. Ultimately, we don't have to rush these things. We don't have to have all the all the understanding. We're growing in our wisdom. We're growing in understanding. And as we do, God will help us as we begin to ask Him, and uh, He will give us the wisdom and the strength to do all of these, all, all that He has called us to do. Second Kings chapter two, starting with verse nineteen. 
We were covering this last week, and it says, And the men of the city said unto Elisha, Behold, I pray thee, the situation of the city is pleasant. As my Lord sees, but the water is not, and the ground is barren. And he said, Bring me a new cruise, and put salt therein. And they brought it to him. And he went forth unto the spring of the waters, and cast the salt in there, and said, Thus says the Lord, I have healed these waters. There shall not be from thence any more death or barren land. So the waters were healed unto this day, according to the saying of Elisha, of Elisha which he spake. In other translations it says, according to the word of Elisha. I, I love this because we see someone here who is not separated from the group. He is one of the people of Israel. Now the people in the city, uh, the, the officials and those, they, it, it, they had brought him to this place. They said everything looks good, everything's fine on the outside. But as we talked and discussed last week, there was something wrong that was underneath the surface. The waters had become, uh, had, had begun to take away life rather than give life. The waters had become brackish. They had begun to mix with other things. And so it seems like something so insignificant, if you will, when Elisha comes and he says, now give me a cruise full of salt. And so we, but we have to understand, he says, give me a new cruise, some, something that hasn't been defiled that has never been used. In other words, something that can be set apart for one use and one use alone. And you see, we are that cruise, as we were talking about last week. We're the one that God will use. And now salt was something that, that the sacrifices had to be, had to be salted. And, and it, was a, it was a purifying agent. Now, for you and I, for the people of the city, it would have been, as I said, it would have been just almost insignificant. Throw a little bit more salt in water that's already getting salt in it, that it's taking away life. In, in the natural realm, we would have said, what are you doing, Elisha? And anybody would have said that. I mean, I mean, you think about even today, we're going to, we're going to water the fields out here with with the water just throw a little bit of uh, a salt a, a cruise of salt in one of those in, in one of the canals out here and and we'll water and, and it's going to heal the waters from here on out you see and and we would think that that little cruise of salt really isn't going to do anything and in the natural it wouldn't do a thing it's not going to heal anything and then even at that would it be a temporary fix no this would be a, a permanent fix because the Bible says even unto this day the waters are healed they're sweetened why because it was the obedience of the people of God it was a, the obedience of the man of God Elisha had heard a word from God and he obeyed what God had told him to do now, had Elisha said, you know what, just give me any old cruise, any old cruise will do, we, the, the whole thing would have been different. God wasn't going to heal the water out of, uh, out of our disobedience. And sometimes we want to go about doing things our way and walking in disobedience, disobeying His Word, disregarding what He says, and we expect God to bless it. And then we wonder why the blessing doesn't come. And this, this applies to so many areas of our life. You see, the one thing is, is that when we know the truth and we hear the truth, it is to put the truth into practice. And, and this, th th that's a hard and a difficult thing because there are a lot of things that you and I want to do that, that God is saying not so fast. But God, I, you know, if I could do this, if I could do that, and I've got plans, and I've got these things coming on, and God, you know what, we can do this and that at the same time, and God's saying, not so fast. I just, I just want your obedience. You see, the Bible teaches us that obedience is better than sacrifice. Listening, hearkening. Then the fat of rams, he was telling them that if you would just listen, you wouldn't even have to sacrifice the rams because I'd rather have your obedience than the, than the ram that was slain on the altar. 
You see, and sometimes we're just like, no, I, I, I'm not going to be obedient, but I'll sacrifice a lot of things for God. And we get nowhere by doing it. And so we sacrifice time and we sacrifice this and we sacrifice that. And we're like, why isn't God blessing? Because you're still not walking in obedience. Because sometimes sacrifice is easier than obedience. Mm -hmm. But a general renewal, as we were talking about, we need revival. And revival doesn't come until we cannot live without it. Revival will not come unless we get to the point where we cannot live without it. You may wonder, why am I feeling this way? Why am I going through all of this? Why do I feel frustrated no matter what I do? Why do I feel like I'm not accomplishing anything even though I'm going 100 miles an hour? And you see, sometimes we, we, we wonder why, we're, why all of these things are going on in our lives. We cannot find rest here or there. We run to and fro. We're going here and there trying to find satisfaction, trying to find peace, trying to find all of these things. If I can just get this done, and then it's on to the next task. And if I can just get this done, if I can just get this done, if I can just get this done. And what, what is God saying? Obedience is better than sacrifice. Stop and take some time out with me. Begin to, begin to pray as, as God asked us. Spend some time in His presence. You see, we get so frustrated and it pushes us to, to all kinds of different things. And, and we get pushed to our wit's end, as they say, until finally we fall down in a heap and we break before God. And God was waiting for that moment to come. And I can tell you this, you can keep running and you can keep running and you can exhaust yourself. And that's exactly what you're going to do. And finally, I pray you come to a place where repentance begins to pour out of your soul. See, a lot of people just say, well, I can just repent and I can have revival whenever I want to. I, I'd argue with you on that. If you can have revival anytime you wanted, I can tell you this, revival is one of the greatest things that you will ever experience. And I'm not talking about just having a series of services. I'm talking about true revival, a renewing of the Spirit. If you could have it anytime you wanted to, I can tell you, you'd have it all the time. The reason that so many people say that is because they really don't know. They, they've, they've lost touch. They don't even know what real, true revival even means anymore. The reviving of a soul. But there will come a day and a time when you cannot live without it. And then you will cry out for it. In, and in that day and in that time, God will hear us. And so God separates us. Even as that vessel was separated for a purpose, God separates us. As we were talking about last week, He pulls us from among the people. You see, many are called, few are chosen. Many are called, few are chosen. And many times the, the, those who are chosen, it's because they hear the call and they heed the call. They don't just allow the call to go by. And I'm not talking about a call into ministry per se. It's just a call into His presence. You see, when God says, draw near to me, and I'll draw near to you, that's not, that's not a, necessarily a call into ministry per se, a ministry position. That is Him calling us to minister unto Him. And can I tell you this, before you will ever minister to the people of God, you'll, you'll have to minister to Him first. Because you will never be able to minister to anyone else until you minister to the Lord first. David was a minister unto the Lord. David was a man after God's heart. And then God said, you know what, this man, that's a man after my heart. I can use him. I can put him anywhere, anywhere in the world and he will be effective because he will seek me in all things. And so God calls us. He sets us apart. He sanctifies us for a, for, for a work to be done. Even as he did Esther for such a time as this. And this is where we left off that he had called Esther for such a time as this. And do you remember what he told Esther? He said, Esther, he says, Mordecai told Esther, he says, you don't have to answer the call if you don't want to. 
She wanted to live in the temple and I mean in the palace and she she thought she was going to have it all and and live it all up. And and he said, don't think that you're you're going to escape what's coming against your people, Esther. He said, you and your family will perish like the rest of them, but God will raise up a deliverer because somebody will accept. You know, I think about this oftentimes when I'm when when I'm thinking about when I stand before Jesus Christ and when you and I are on that great day before the throne room, before the throne of God, that great white throne judgment. How many, t- how, how many of us are going to stand there and have regrets and think, think I wish I would have, wish I could have, should have done this, should have done that. And Esther, he was saying to Esther, you can, you can choose to do this or you can choose not to. God is setting you apart for this work. But if you deny it, he will find somebody who will answer the call. And you will miss the greatest opportunity, the very opportunity that you have been created for. For what? For your own pleasures. For your, for, for your own desires. For the things that you deem important rather than the calling of God upon your life. Esther was involved in this, in this situation. He was going to use her and he was going to give her a testimony. And he was going to make her a witness to the people around him. And I, and I love the thought of, of the very reason that Jesus Christ baptizes us with the Holy Spirit. The reason he baptizes us with the Holy Spirit is to make us witnesses of him. To make us witnesses of Him. I know a lot of people make that a lot of different things. And and I'm telling you, you, it just depends on where their mind's at, where their their heart is, whatever it may be. I can tell you this, it's to be a witness of who He is. It's just to be a witness of who He is. It doesn't matter where you are. It's just to be a witness of who He is. I was blind, but now I see. Well, I think your parents were sinners and that's why you were blind and that's why this and that's why that. Well, whether they were sinners or not, whether he has devil or not, I don't know. But this one thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. You see, he gives us a testimony and that testimony becomes a witness to those that are around us. And He makes us a witness and a powerful witness to those. And and, and, and it's it's not even a, a, a formal, if you will, a formal call of ministry. Because I know that we get into all of this stuff and, and everybody's, you know, has to be a minister and everybody has to do, and everybody, no, no, no. He calls us to be witnesses. Each and every one of us. It doesn't matter if you work in a, in, in, in a graveyard. It doesn't matter if you work on the, on the truck yard. It doesn't matter where you, whether you work in a concrete plant. It doesn't matter whether you work in an office. He's made you a witness unto Him. And He calls you right in the middle of where you are and says, you know what, I need you to be a witness among these people. I'm going to put my testimony upon your life. And so he calls us to represent the people that we are associated with. And that's exactly what he did with with Esther. That's exactly what he did with Elisha. And this same relative, and it's it's relative and representative. It's a it's a characterized it's it characterized Daniel and his uh and, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You see, they took the condition of the whole captive nation in their hearts. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They had entered into a vicarious repentance for the sins of all of Israel. Now, they, did, they, they weren't necessarily... They could, they could have probably sat back and said, You know what? We weren't part of the problem here. And, and you, you and I might say, Well, you know, well... well That's their problem. That's not my problem. And that's your problem. You see, as we 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 it's unless it directly affects me, then then it's not my problem. 
and that's your problem. Well, it doesn't matter if, it, if it's affecting my neighbors or somebody in another state or another country or, or somebody else, as long as it isn't happening under my roof, and that's your problem. You see, and that's why God, what God is setting you apart for, He's calling you for something. But the thing is, is you have never, you have never connected yourself to the people that are around you. You have, you have made it, you have made your life your own. But you, you forgot the, the part where you were bought with a price. And that your life no longer belongs to you. And that whatever God desires from you and wants out of you, He gets to have. And you know, and I, and, and I, and I think about Christianity in today's time. It is so weak and it's, 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 it's not representative of what it should be. We make up our own rules. But they entered into a, a, a vicarious repentance. Meaning they became, they made themselves one with the other. Just as the Bible t- teaches us that he that knew no sin became sin. And the only reason that you and I are delivered today is because Jesus Christ became sin for us. We know that He took our sin upon Him. But the Bible says that He that knew no sin became sin. And He took our sin upon Himself. Upon himself. In other words, He entered into your relationship with sin in mine. Because the only way to defeat the sin in our life was to enter into the, into the relationship with us. That's why, it's, that's why the, the, the beautiful part about it is he didn't wait for you and I to get cleaned up. He knew we could never be cleaned apart from him. So the Bible says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He died for you and I while we were yet in our trespasses and sin. He entered into your sin so that you could be delivered from your sin. And this is the same thing that He calls each and every one of us to do. The same, the same calling. As He was in this world, so are we. So we enter into the problems of the people that are around us. Well, I just don't want to get involved. I'm not talking about getting all involved in their issues and, and giving your opinions and things of that nature. I'm talking about getting involved spiritually, beginning to pray for them. You see the problem, you take it to the Lord in prayer because they can't. They don't know how to take it to the Lord in prayer. And so you enter into their sin. You enter into their problems. You begin to intercede for them. But surely I've got something to do on Friday night. I've got a thousand other things I could do on Friday night than than to, than to ruin my plans and have to head over there. But yet what do we do as Christians? Oh, I've got I'm I'm I've I've, I've got plans. We'll leave it up to pastor. That's his job. Whoa, whoa. Should have said that on Sunday. (laughs) But isn't that what we do? It's always pushing it off on someone else. And that's why there's not many people that will say, you know what? I know that I have nothing to do with this. I know that this has nothing to do with me, but I'm going to make it my business. And I'm going to take it to the Lord in prayer because you may not know how to. And maybe you don't have the strength to. Maybe you don't know Christ at that moment. But I am there to be a witness of who Jesus Christ is. And even though they may not know it, I am going to go in and I am going to go into battle for them. Their pain becomes my pain. Their joy becomes my joy. Their deliverance becomes my deliverance. We tie ourselves so closely with those who we truly repent and are, are come into relationship with and, and, and who we intercede for. See, the Bible says they were overcomers at that time. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were the overcomers at that time. But all their experience, their revelation and victory 
was in deep relationship with the people of God. Even though the people of God at that time were apostate. You see, sometimes, sometimes you're the one that has to carry the load. And, and that's, that's not easy. Because the truth is, the truth is there are very few that care to carry the load. Husbands negate their responsibilities and the wife has to carry the load. Wives negate their responsibilities and the husband has to carry the load. We see it all the time. We, we, we see it in relationship with everything. And now there's not a lot of people that like to carry, that carry the load. No, I, I'm, I'm just trying to get through on my own and that's the problem. You'll never experience the full deliverance of God until you start looking at other people rather than focusing on yourself and doing everything for yourself and thinking about yourself and yourself and yourself and yourself. Because God didn't call you to be selfish. He called you to be selfless. We get so caught up in these things and we don't care about the needs of anyone else. We may say we care about them. And if somebody says, pray for, oh, we'll be praying for you. But you never really prayed for them. You may even text them in a message, oh, we'll be praying for you. But you never stopped to actually pray. And can I tell you this? Your text message didn't, didn't, didn't meet the, the requirements of a prayer. Mm. Pastor, keep going. But they were the ones carrying the load. While the rest of the, the people of Israel that were in captivity were, 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 were just giving in to the rest of what, what was going on in Babylon at that time. They were all tangled in the sin of Babylon at that time. They were all doing the idol worship. Some of them out of fear. Some of them because they just didn't care. But yet Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego wouldn't bend their knee and wouldn't give in to the pressures that were around them. And because of them, they preserved Israel. Do you remember what Joseph was called to do? And Joseph realizes it at the very end after his father dies and his brothers are sitting around and saying, surely now Joseph is so angry at us, he's just going to have us all killed. I mean, he has the authority. He has, the, he has all of Egypt behind him. He's going to do it. And Joseph says, what you meant for evil. God turned around for good. And he brought me here ahead of you that I might preserve your lives. You see, you, you, you don't understand why you were sold off. You don't understand why those people talked about you. You don't understand why you were mistreated. You don't understand why you had to, to suffer the abuse that you had to suffer. Why you had to go through what you had to go through. But I can tell you this, because God was sending you ahead of time, because He needed someone who knew what it felt like to be disregarded, to be left alone, to be forgotten about, so that he could that, that person could intercede for the very people that did that to them many times you feel like man I'm the only one in my family and you, you very well may be the only one in your entire family but it's because of you that your entire family is experiencing the blessing And when you think about it that way, then it, then, then, then it really comes down and, and then the, the weight begins to really set in that, that the rise and fall of your family depends upon you even though you may feel like a little nobody. Mm. The vessel that God uses is not some superior class. It's not something that, that, that was, oh, this, this, this person's better than this person and this is why God... No, it was, it was the willing vessel. The one that was willing to, to stand. God's forging an instrument. 
He's forging an instrument through which he can, he can reach the whole world, the whole group, all of those. You know, I know sometimes we want to save the world, and, but, but, we, but we, can't, we can't even witness to our brother or sister. We want, to, we want to go around and we want to do all of these things, but we can't even be faithful where we're at. Man, when Hezekiah was the instrument in, in turning back the, the idolatry and the wickedness that had, that had totally taken over Israel because of Ahaz, I want you to turn with me in 2 Second Chronicles chapter 29. We're going to read something, just a little something, because... What, what an awesome picture this evening. What a, what a, what a, I mean, God has given us His Word for, for some good things. And, and sometimes we just, don't, we just don't pay attention to the Word. We, I'm telling you, we, we neglect the things of God. We wonder why we're, why, why we're feeling the way that we do. Or we, or we just go through our little, you know, have to's. I have to do this and I have to do that. And if I can just do this and if I can just do that, can I tell you this? Make your relationship with God real. I'm not saying that a little Bible study here and there isn't isn't a bad thing, but but you know you can do a Bible study and 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 get nothing out of it. You can read a little devotional every day and get nothing at all out of it and, and just check the box. Did it. Done. But nothing came out of it. Or you can just take a few minutes in the presence of God and just go before Him and be honest and say, God, I don't, I'm wretched. I'm undone. I've lost my way. Don't know what's going on in my life, God. Can you help me? Because God will not turn away broken, sincere, in a contrite heart. Verse 18, Then the Levites went to King Hezekiah and gave him this report, We have cleansed the entire temple of the Lord. The altar of burnt offering with all its utensils and the table of the bread of the presence with all its utensils. We have also recovered all the items discarded by King Ahaz when he was unfaithful and closed the temple, they are now in front of the altar of the Lord, purified and ready to use. Second Chronicles chapter 29, we're at verse 20 now. Early the next morning, King Hezekiah gathered the city officials and went to the temple of the Lord. They brought seven bulls, seven rams, and seven male lambs, and a burnt offering together with the seven male goats, and a sin offering for the kingdom for the temple, and for Judah. The king commanded the priests, who were descendants of Aaron, to sacrifice the animals on the altar of the Lord. They killed the bulls, and the priests took the blood of the sprinkled and sprinkled it on the altar. Next, they killed the rams and sprinkled the blood on the altar, and finally they did the same with the male lambs. The male goats for the sin offering were then brought before the king and the assembly of the people who laid their hands on them. And that laying on of hands was, the, was a transferring of their sin onto these animals. The priests then killed the goats as a sin offering and sprinkled their blood on the altar to make atonement for the sins of Israel. The king had specifically commanded that this burnt offering and sin offering should be made for all of Israel. So what happens here is, is king, king Ahaz had, had done evil in the sight of the Lord and he had desecrated everything. And so King Hezekiah comes and, and he receives this and, and he was king over Israel, but he wasn't. Israel and Judah were, were completely different. And, and, and so he, he wanted to make atonement, not just for Israel, but also for Judah. And in, in chapter 30, you'll see it, in, in, he begins to make preparations for the Passover. 
But things were so out of place that, that the Passover couldn't be uh, observed at the time that it should have been observed. And so they decided, you know what, we're not going to observe it at exactly the time, but we feel that God would be pleased if we go ahead and observe it now. And God was pleased for for a lot of those who, even in the Old Testament, you know, I mean, no, unless you did it on this day, in this time, in this place, in this way, even in the Old Testament, God saw the heart. He saw that Hezekiah wasn't doing it because, because he thought that he was the only one that could do it. Hezekiah knew that God had called him for such a time. Now, he didn't have to include Judah, but he, but he included Judah. And so the Bible says that God moved in the heart of Judah and upon the people of Judah so that they would also observe with them. Now, Israel was the one that was com completely in, in the sin, and Judah wasn't necessarily all entangled in it, but there was such a heart for the people of Israel all at once that God said, you know, I want you not just for your people, but they are all my people. And you know, we, we, we don't understand that. God is calling us not just to, not, not, not just to the people we think, but He's calling us to pray for all of His people. Not just for those that are a part of this church, but for those that are a part of the body of Christ everywhere. He is calling us to intercede and to pray for them. See, Hezekiah's heart went out to everyone. It went out to the whole of the kingdom. At this time, the kingdom was split. And Israel was, was the one that was much more adulterous than Judah. And, and Israel was the one that, 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 you know, we could have said, well, well, you know what, we're doing this for Israel because Israel's the one that had sinned. But no, he said, no, all of us, we've all sinned. Every one of us. You know, you may feel like, well, I, I, I've done nothing wrong. Now you did. Maybe, maybe you didn't get that. You see, we, we begin to say, well, well, you know, at least I'm not as bad as. At least I'm not like those other people. And God says, now you are. As a matter of fact, you're probably worse. He didn't allow the grossness of idolatry to cause him to abandon those that had sinned. He didn't turn away from them and say, you know what, God, I, I, they deserve what, what's coming to them. They deserve what they're getting. You see, it's easy to turn your, your head and, and, and let everybody else, you know, let everybody else deal with their own problems. I, it, it's, it has nothing to, to, to do with me. You see, in our world today, we, we are confronted with great problems today. We see it politically all around us, but we see it spiritually more than anything. I see the blinders on so many people. I'm talking about believers there are many spiritual, there are many believers or people that are Christians that are blind today. They cannot see the destruction that is coming their way. Wouldn't it be something for the watchman on the wall to say, well, that's their problem. And that's what a lot of people do today. Well, it's their problem. And, and why is the enemy fighting you so hard in this area? Why is he fighting you so hard to take the lead? Why is he fighting you so hard? Because he wants those people to, to die in their sin. And, and you may be the one that God is using to pull them and to call them out of the place where they're at. And if he can discourage you, and if He can get you down, and if He can defeat you, and if He can destroy you, then, then, then He has them. This is not a time to give up. This is not a time to walk away. As difficult as it may be, we must stand. We must pray that God would give us 
the ability to stand under these circumstances. You see, if we're to see God's revival, then we are going to have to boldly stand. We're going to, I'm telling you, the storm is going to strip away everything that is not of God. The fire is going to come and consume us and it's going to take away everything that is not of God. If I, 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 I'm, I'm here to encourage you. If you think it's bad now, it's going to get worse. <laughs> Praise God. Wait a minute, that wasn't encouragement. It always gets worse before it gets better. And what God is doing is He's doing something in you. He's, do, he's, he's bringing you through something so that you can help others come through the very same thing. And, and sometimes you're the one. You're, the, you're, you're, the, you're, the, you're at the helm. You're the one that's taking the brunt of it. And, it. and it's very difficult because you're the one that is facing it so that others don't have to face what you're facing. What does Paul say? We experience death that you can experience life. We're pressed down. We're crushed. And, I, and, and the reason why all of these things are happening to us is so that you can experience the goodness of God. I mean, what an exchange here. <laughs> as difficult as it is, if we're going to see the revival that God wants to bring, and if we're going to be the instruments that God will use to bring that revival, then we are going to have to be willing to identify ourselves with our brethren. We're going to have to be willing to take on whatever it is that they're facing. I, I, that, that's not popular today. I'm sorry, but it's not popular. We're going to have to be the ones to pray through and cry out. And it's not going to be so that somebody can give you a plaque or they can put your name somewhere. You leave that up to God. But God is going to call us into a time of solitude and a time of prayer. This is not, and, 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 and hear me, this is not some, some call for unity in, in, in areas that we disagree with, such as idolatry, heresy, apostasy, or any of those things. It is us identifying with our brothers that, that if it had not been for the grace of God, we would be right there. And the only reason that God brought you out and delivered you is so that He could send you back in to bring others out. You thought you came out of the fire and you thought, man, I made it by the... Now he's saying, now go back in there. Because I've got something for you to do. I can tell you it'll be worth it all. God will make it worth it all. When we speak of being relative and, and representative of those that are around us, it can only be those who have been truly born again. And God is calling us for, for, for those of the household of faith. He's called us out from among them so that we can help them. Because there are many people that truly are called of God that they do not even know it. You, you know, this, this is a doctrine many people don't even like to step in and mention it even. But, but you have been predestined. You were called of God before the beginning of time. And somebody needs to go in and find you. Paul says, I've become all things to all men that by all means I might save some. He knew he couldn't save them all. Because not even Christ could save them all. Oh, I know I just offended somebody right there. Look at Judas. What God is doing is he's calling those whom there's something of his spirit that is in them. The people that will, will, will be a part of this is, is those that know God. You see, we're not talking about a, a, a movement. As I said, some ecumenical thing just trying to bring everybody in and sacrifice our convictions for the sake of unity. That's, that's not us. But no matter, no matter how bad the spiritual condition of those who have been born of God, and listen to me, there's, there are those that are born of God that if you, if you knew, you would say, surely they're not a believer. You know, I thought about that. I think about this sometimes. I think about David and his mighty men. 
and you know we've seen enough we've seen enough on in Hollywood to to kind of get some somewhat of a picture of those things but I just think of David and his mighty men after a battle swords are, are bent and some of them broken and cuts everywhere and blood everywhere and they're sitting around a, a table and I just sometimes think what what would what would be the conversations that went on with you and I would have walked in the room and thought, man, there's surely, surely this, there's not a godly man in here. And yet God says, don't call unclean what I've cleansed. God has some out there that they're just needing someone to sound the alarm. Watch it be a Benaiah that when you when they finally come and they wake up to the to the fact that God has delivered them, saved them, and set them free, they'll put us all to shame. Oh, but that that, that that's why I don't do it because if it's not if it's not me, can't we just be like a Barnabas that says, "Oh, praise God, finally found the man." <laughs> no matter how bad spiritually their condition looks, we cannot exclude them from the spiritual fellowship because God didn't exclude you and me. It doesn't mean that we join them in open sin, but we bring them the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it's the gospel, it's the truth that sets men free. It doesn't matter what they look like or how hard they seem or, or the difficulties they've been through. I can tell you God has called them. Doesn't mean we fellowship in their works. But it does mean in earnest, loving, concern, thoughtful, helpful, jealous, eager, ardent, in solitude, we begin to cry out to God on their behalf. As if it was our own soul that was at stake. You want revival? You want to see revival? Then begin to cry out and call out to God for other people rather than yourself. God prosper them. God raise them up. God use them. God, make them something. I pray that God, that you'd meet every need that they have, that you would answer their prayer, that God, that you would, you would strengthen them. They need strength right now. Yes, I need strength, but God, they need it more. God, if you have to pass by me, Father, I pray that you'd bless my brother. God calls us into deeper fellowship. But in order for any of this to take place, God has to have a vessel that has been forged in the fire. Set apart. Peculiar unto Himself. Anybody heard of that cruise? We know about Elijah. But the new cruise? We don't know where it's at. And sometimes we may feel the same way. But praise God. We were used for the very purpose we were created for. I know it's not always easy, but it's needful. God is calling you and I, and I and I, and I, and I want to. I don't have time to go on, but. 
That's what it is to be an intercessor. And to intercede for others is to take the heart of God. Is to put others before yourself. To put their needs before your own needs. To intercede. That intercessor is a person that will break through for someone else. They'll get a breakthrough. And they may not even know why. But it was because you prayed. True intercessors are far few and in between. I remind those that join us on Tuesdays of this all the time. Whether they join us online. Or they make their way here. That Tuesdays is probably the most important service of the week. And God has a special blessing for those who will intercede and break through for someone else. Because after all, isn't that what Jesus Christ did for us? He did for us what we could not do for ourselves. When we become an intercessor, we become like Christ. And that's why the Bible says that God looked to and fro throughout the whole earth and He couldn't find one. That's hard. Didn't mean that He didn't find a lot of churches. Didn't mean that He didn't find a lot of Christians. Didn't mean that he didn't find a lot of religious activity going on. Didn't mean that he didn't hear a lot of screaming and hollering and worship and praying and all of these things. But he couldn't find an intercessor. Someone who would break through for someone else. And I pray that that would be our testimony. That we would break through for someone else. That we would become intercessors. And as the Bible teaches us that even now, Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. And He lives to make intercession for you and me. The only reason that you and I are here today, the only reason that we continually break through is because Jesus is interceding for you and me. Will we do the same? Father, we thank you tonight, God. And Lord, we just, we just put your word out there, Father. Not easy, very difficult at times. Difficult to deliver. And even difficult to, to receive many times. But I pray, God, that you would help us not to think so much of ourselves as we would of those, Father, that you have called us and separated us to represent. Pray that, God, that we would begin to, to cry out, Father, for that one on the street. For those, Father, that are in our own home or of our own family that everybody else has forsaken and forgotten. That, God, that that one that has been counted out and seems to have no hope. We pray that, Father, that they would not slip through the cracks, but, God, we would, we would cry out. And, Father, if we don't know who they are, we pray that you would reveal to our hearts, God, who they are, that we can effectively pray on their behalf. Help us, Father, not to merely look at the obvious that is before us, but to truly seek you so that we can hear your heart and know what it is, Father, and know who they are. That, God, that we can, we can be effective, whether it's a classmate, whether it's a friend, a family member, 
whoever it may be, God, may we not let one of them slip through the crack. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would awaken us, that you would make us alive in your presence, that you would quicken us so that, Father, that you would be glorified. Teach us and help us, Jesus, to be like you. We ask it, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus. I pray that our hearts would burn and our soul, Father, would just desire you more than anything, Father, in this life. May we never forget, Father, what you have done for us. We ask it, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, to you be the glory, the honor, and the praise. Amen and amen. Praise God. In Jesus' name, praise God. Thank you for being with us this evening. Thank you for, for coming. Thank you for joining us online. Uh, again, thank you for your faithfulness and giving. Um, we, just, we just give all the glory to God. Um, you can still give on our app, our website. Uh, Brother Mario's here. You came ready to give that way. But uh, without you, we couldn't do what we do and, and uh, preach this gospel. And uh, we thank you in Jesus' name. We love you, and we look forward to seeing you on Sunday. God bless you. Amen. Amen.